Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Savick, and welcome to another edition of Paranormal Almanac. On this edition, let's talk about the Greenstone. But first, as always, we have shout-outs. That's right, we have shout-outs going out to... Oh, I didn't get his name again. Oh, man, I'm terrible. Hrodgar. Hrodgar. Hrodjar. I'm going to keep saying it till I get it right. Hrodgar Todora. Michael, Dustin, Matthew, Alicia, Derek, Becca, Josh... Alexis, Jen, Elizabeth, Voidtech, Steve, Sherry, Art Muffin, Trudy, Tim, Ken, Kenneth, Paul, Ricardo, Damien, and Daniel, Car- uh, Eric, Brandon, Jen, Alexandra, Simon, George, Connie, Seth, Christine, Jason, Hayden, Cindy, Kim, Adam, Ashley, Fran, what's that? Loki, you're Ian, Carrie, Ezra, Robin, Will, Jim, Kelly, Lauren, and Phil Mangano, Russell, Tanya, Donald. Chris, Brandon, April, Seth, Isabel, Andra, Dorian, Dorian, Daniel, Cindy, Bob, Sean Bishop, Cole, Paula, Alicia, Jerry, Leo, Lindsay Hahn, Jennifer, Megan, Aaron, Amy, Jeff T, Harley, Suzanne, Joe, Lawrence, Laura McCune, hey, howdy, hi, Lily, Veronica, Nick, Autumn, J. Mark, Carolyn, Martin, Darth, Pikachu, Jade, Nanashi, Megan, Heidi, Kira, Pablo, Chuck, Laura, Ruth, O, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Juliana, Dan, Laura and Gamer Fan with a little bark from Stitch. Special shout out to Joe Teague. All righty. Let's get right on to this. I got a big episode today. So let's go right into paranormal news. Thank you once again to Andrew Olson, sound designer. Uh, He's the best. I finally got some stuff uploaded into this for Paranormal News, so you didn't have to hear me whisper Paranormal News all weak ass like I have been doing the past couple episodes. So, hold on, i got to adjust this microphone just a little bit. There we go. So, let's get right into Paranormal News. The first story in Paranormal News, a story that makes me happy. Nessie spotted for the fourth time this year as black shapes are seen in the water. I was like, I've already done this one. But no, this story came out today. They say the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster, not a monster, has captured people's imaginations for years, and now, oh boy, that's a name I can't say, said that he recorded a strange disturbance in the water. That's right, another sighting of Nessie has been registered this year with two black humps seen in the water. Ian O'Fadhagen Oh, I screwed that up. But uh, you're Scottish. You're not Irish, so I can screw it. Oh, no, you're Irish. Oh, God, he's from Ireland. And I screwed his name up on St. Patrick's Day. I'm a dick. Uh, Claims to have spotted the shapes around 10 feet apart and splashing around in Loch Ness in the Highlands just last Friday. 56-year-old said he noticed the mythical beast rising up and down near the castle. That's the area where the sightings of the mystery creature are at their highest. Now, he has had 12 sightings recorded by the official Loch Ness Monster, not a monster, sightings register since 1987. The health worker from Donegal, Ireland, managed to record the strange disturbance via a Loch Ness webcam. That's right, yet another example of you could be like this man. You could be spotting Nessie from the comfort of your own home. But no, what are you doing instead? You, I don't know, what are you... What, are you just sitting around, you're drinking your green beer and getting drunk on St. Patrick's Day? Well, do that, but, you know, look for Nessie also. Come on, man. Anyhow, it goes on to say that his video shows thick ripples out in the water, despite there being no boats on the lock. Two large breaks in the water appear with a rough distance of about 10 feet between them. The humps slowly move over the surface of the water for an extended period of time before completely disappearing. Ian immediately sent his new sightings across to the official sightings register, who then registered it 
as an official sighting, as you do. Now, I can't find any video of it. They have a, a screen grab of it with a circle around it, but it doesn't look like much to me. But, hey, what do I know? This guy's seen him 12 times. I think he knows a little bit more about Nessie than I do. He said, while watching the webcam in the late afternoon, my attention was attracted to a disturbance in the water in the middle of the lake. A black shape broke the surface with a wake. It was moving slowly, but was causing a lot of water agitation around it. Two black hump-like shapes seem to be popping up and down as it cut through the surface of the lock. The object is, a view, is viewed for 1 minute and 41 seconds. After this, it just disappeared. There was no boat activity on the lake at the time of the sighting, and he added, On my very first visit, I had a sighting of a large mottled brown hump uh, in June of 1987. That, sl that sighting only intrigued me further into Nessie. I have now captured 12 sightings to the date to date in the last four years. He said he claimed to have seen two uh, black shapes about 100 feet apart splashing in the water on January 19th and January 22nd this year. Another Ness Nessie fanatic, Kaylin Wangle from Oregon, logged the first sighting for 2021 on January 11th when she noticed a V shape in the, in the lock it was there for only a few seconds. The 27-year-old sighting shows a black blur near the front of the bay for the webcam front of the bay for the webcam beside a tree. No idea what that means. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. The point of that is that Nessie has been sighted and Stitch is being a jerk. Hold on one second. All righty, we are back. The next story in paranormal news. Are cryptids lurking in the forest of Big Sur? Dark Watchers are the new Bigfoot. Now, I actually toyed with doing an episode all about Dark Watchers, and I still might. I just meant I was going to do it for this week's episode because of this story, but then I decided, eh, I'll, I'll do the story now, investigate Dark Watchers, and then decide. So, now it's up for you guys to decide. Are Dark Watchers the new Bigfoot? The story says, what places do you think of when you think of cryptids? Loch Ness is likely at the top of most people's lists. The woods of the Pacific Northwest abound with Sasquatches in some stories. There's also the presence of the Yetis in the Himalayas, but a recent San Francisco Gate article by Katie Dowd suggests there's another cryptid hotspot waiting to happen. It just happens to be one of the most scenic parts of the United States, Big Sur. According to the article, the woods in the Big Sur, woods in Big Sur, are home to the Dark Watchers, towering creatures that have called the forest home for centuries. The history of the Dark Watchers go back centuries and began with the indigenous people who were the uh, region's first inhabitants. The Spanish colonizers in the 18th century also talked about Dark Watchers. They detected them, and sightings of the mysterious figures continued in the years that followed. One notable believer was John Steinbeck's mother, who would leave gifts for the Dark Watchers and reportedly found flowers in return. Dowd writes that Steinbeck himself alluded to the Dark Watchers in his first short story, Flight. Let's see, the uh, article offers a number of explanations for the Dark Watchers, including a human tendency to project figures into shadows and a quirk for the climate, and a quirk of the climate in the Big Sur region one which could distort existing shadows into something more mysterious, but it's always possible that there's something in the woods in Big Sur beyond what we can imagine. So, there you have it. That is your taste, your little amuse-bouche of Dark Watchers. I'm going to, uh, like I said, it's on my list. I'll put it that way. Since it's on my list, let's move on to the next story in Paranormal News. A legendary Utah nunnery, rumored to be haunted, is up for sale. You guys always seem to like the haunted real estate, so now's your chance to buy something. This is a brand new story. One of Utah's most storied properties, long rumored to be haunted, is for sale. Next to the Logan River and Highway 89 that connects Logan, Utah with Beaver Mountain Ski Area and Bear Lake, sits what was once known as St. Anne's Nunnery, or more officially, St. Anne's Retreat. Locals and Utah State University students know it as a hot spot for ghost stories with legends of pregnant nuns and death. All right, not only is the property the stuff of legends, it has a fascinating actual history too, including when three men held a group of teens at gunpoint in the bottom of a swimming pool and later pleaded guilty to their crimes. Oh, I had a text. As interesting as that is to confirm, 
It's the folklore of pregnant nuns and hauntings of ghost babies that really seem to capture the imagination of the community. I'm trying to do a podcast, whoever you are. It is even served as fodder for Ghost Hunter TV shows. Let's see. uh, The Travel Channel has been there as well. They said, we're investigating a dark demonic entity that a a psychic we had earlier was possessed by. The story goes on to say, the promotional material from the real estate company isn't nearly so grim, though. An amazing investment opportunity in Logan Canyon, largest retreat, largest retreat in the Cache National Forest, and the only one with a swimming pool. This property has a rich history that was started by the Hatch family as a retreat in 1910. The past also includes the Odlum family, who collectively built the property in the 1920s. So it's a huge, huge property, 21 buildings and structures, structures, two main lodges, six smaller cabins, a playhouse, a pool house, generator house, along with a fireplace, bridge, and swimming pool. All showings need to be arranged with the listing, blah, blah, blah. So if you want to do it, if you want to buy it, feel free to buy it. Sounds like it's going to be a very expensive thing. So uh, let's see how much it's going to be. No, that can't be it. $700,000? That's not bad at all. For 12 bedrooms, 9 baths, 6,000 square feet, you got haunted nuns, haunted babies, pregnant haunted nuns. 700 grand in American, that's not too shabby. So go to utahrealestate.com, take a look for it. It's 89 Pine Glen, 89 Pine Glen CV in Logan, Utah. For 700 grand, it could be yours. Or you could buy it from me. We'll make it the Paranormal Almanac headquarters. You guys could all come out and visit and uh, swim with some um, pregnant ghosts and dead babies. All righty, up next in paranormal news. Security camera records paranormal activity in Texas home with video. Now, as you guys know, if it's got video, I don't watch the video until I do it live on air. Well, not live, but live for me on air on the podcast. This uh, story says, ghost and paranormal activity has always fascinated me. My family was very open to the idea of spirits living amongst us uh, because of some of the things that have happened to a family member over the years. Once you see or feel something, life is never the same. You realize there's more to our reality than what we can see. I'll share my stories later. First, I want to include introduce you to Tammy Jarmuthy. Sure, why not? Like me, she and her family have a history of paranormal activity. She believes um, she has a gift or curse. And here's her chilling and at times terrifying story. Plus, you misspelled chilling. You said shilling. I have seen spirits since I was uh, five. I realized I was sensitive when I was 12. My family and I went to look at a home, and I walked into the house and automatically felt an energy there. I told my parents I didn't want to live there because it was haunted. They dismissed me, and we moved in the very first week. Uh, We were eating dinner. My room was kitty corner to the dining room, and my stereo turned on by itself. It also started changing CDs as well. I sat down after turning it off and I said, told you so. Then the TV turned on. That house was extremely active and I lived in fear till I was about 16. When I started to do research and learn about spirits, then I became super intrigued and started investigating at the age of 20. All the women on my mom's side of the family have the gift. My grandma had nine sisters and all of them and their daughters are gifted. My great-grandma was a witch of sorts. She did tarots and spells. Since the, house, uh, since the house when I was 12, all my homes have been active. I've had an attachment since I was young. We think it's some sort of generational curse or bloodline thing. My last two homes have been extremely active with things moving on their own. Shadow figures, full-bodied apparitions, doppelgangers, being attacked, and the list goes on. In my career of investigating, I've done all sorts of residential cases that go from residential hauntings to demonic ghosts. Now, I've investigated historical locations, pardon me, from the States to the catacombs in Prague, and I've been on ghost adventures, paranormal caught on camera, the Osbournes want to believe, and more. So, she's making a documentary about her incredible life with spirits, ghosts, and the paranormal activity. Here are some of the clips of the activity caught on camera for her upcoming film. So let's uh, let's do a quick watch, shall we? Oh, these are actually really recent, too. Okay, let's see what happens. Spooky music, spooky music, spooky music. All right, we can turn down the spooky music. Um, so the first one is the grandfather clock face door opening. Sure, but if 
it wasn't closed all the way. Grandfather clocks tend to lean forward just a touch, so it could have swung open. The next one is something on the fireplace. Wait, go back. I want to see what the heck that was. Something on the fireplace kind of like jumped off or something. It's like a basket of some kind on the fireplace. I'll put this up in uh, Facebook and I'll put it up on the patron uh, Patreon page because I've had a patr- couple patrons say they want to see them, but they don't like Facebook. Don't blame you. I don't like Facebook either. Uh, yeah, it's like a basket jumping off. Now there's a chair moving. Eh, I don't trust it. I'll be honest. The chair moving is in the worst, absolute worst spot it could possibly be, so you can't say that. Yeah, all right. This is now the second or third one where something has moved from off camera onto camera or behind something, so you can't really see it. Third or fourth one, actually. All right, we got a doll in a case. Yeah, the arm seems to move. I would put, if I was to put these on that live weird shit show one, I would probably debunk a couple of them, but I can't say they're not necessary. I can't say they're 100% fake. Like in this one, the cat's not moving when something's moving behind it. So they're very intriguing. I'll put it that way. I don't know if I 100% say it's haunted. Oh, that's the end of it. Okay. They're very intriguing. I'll give her that. I would like to talk to her on 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 the air. You do an episode with her so I can, you know, really get down to the, the nitty gritty. And maybe I'll reach out to her on her YouTube page and uh and, and interview her. Look, Tammy, if you're listening to this and you go, Well, I don't want to go on your show, you just said it was fake. No, no. I just said some of it could be faked, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit. Anyhow, it's very intriguing. To say the least. Like I say, I'll put that up on the Facebook. If I, hopefully, if I remember, I'll throw it up on the Patreon. If I forget, some patron remind me, I'll throw it up on the Patreon as well. The next one says, Grandmother calls paranormal experts after spotting demon standing over her granddaughter's bed. The woman is completely freaked out and admits she needs to do a do- She needed to do a double take. Um, sure. The story is from uh, Las Vegas. Tori McKenzie explains that after her two-year-old granddaughter, Amber, had begun talking to an unseen entity in the middle of the night, she decided to install a motion-activated camera at her son's Ryan's house to uh, try to make sense of who the toddler was speaking to. That's cool. I'm all behind that. I like that. A few days later, Tori admits that she checked the footage and was horrified to see an unknown figure standing close to her young granddaughter and seven-month-old seven month grandson Michael's cribs. She said it was so shocking when I saw it. I had to do a double take. The first thing I saw was horns on its head. So we immediately think it's a devil or a demon. When we caught videos of the orbs, we thought it was maybe a family member looking after the kids, but that picture, I have no idea. It's terrifying. Hold on, I gotta go back to the picture. I'm looking at the picture. To me, it looks like... An elder, I'll be honest, it looks like an elderly person with glasses, kind of hunched over, kind of trying to sneak away from from uh, sleeping kids. It doesn't look, I don't see horns, I can tell you that much. Doesn't look like horns to me. It looks to, like, it looks to me like an elderly person. Uh, let's keep on going on. Uh, Tori adds that it doesn't seem like the child is terrified of the figure. My two-year-old isn't scared of the figure and thinks it's her friend, but one night she told it to go away. So she shared the image on a Facebook group asking paranormal experts to help. She says that when she tried to get uh, rid of the demon by burning oils, cabinets, and curtains opened and closed, and music began to play by itself. Ryan has let me try and figure it out where to go with this, so I thought I should post it on Facebook to try and get some help. For the most part, everyone's been supportive, suggestive what to do and who to speak to. I just want to get rid of whatever it is. All right, well, it's interesting. I will say... I will say that based on the photo, I personally don't think it's a demon or a devil. I don't see any horns. It looks like an older person to me. I would say it's an older gentleman or an older woman with uh, shorter hair or hair pulled back. Um, I would I would even say it looks like an older woman to me. So if I was to give her advice, I would say take a look at photos of the other grandparents, because this is a granddaughter's bed, other grandparents or relatives that have passed, older relatives that have passed, and show them to the kid one by one until she points and says, like, yep, that's my friend. My bet is 
it's going to be a deceased relative and that had never met the kid in real life or maybe met the kid once when the you know when where they were a baby but if the kid can talk and say that it's her friend and everything just show her some photos of of deceased relatives my bet is she points to one of them still kind of neat all righty up next in paranormal news Toledo Museum of Art welcomes paranormal exhibit this summer. Damn it. I want to go to this. Uh, Supernatural America, the paranormal in American art, will be on display starting in June. So if you guys are in or near Toledo, or you're going to be near Toledo, the Toledo Museum of Art's newest exhibit will explore the paranormal. It's uh, on display from June 12th to September 5th. This is the first museum exhibit to broadly examine the relationship between American artists and the supernatural. The display was uh, organized. That uh, doesn't matter. I don't care about that. They go on to say where, uh, whether through early early pseudo scientific studies seeking to understand parapsychology, government documentations of UFOs, or individual reckonings with the spirits of those who have passed away, American culture is filled with tales of the supernatural and accounts of the paranormal experience. That is a mouthful, Lauren Applebaum, who wrote that. This complex and multifaceted subject has beguiled American artists for centuries and remains compelling to uh, audiences today. Okay, Stitch, it's cool, buddy. Lauren Applebaum didn't mean to be so wordy. Admission is free for museum members and $12 for non-museum members and uh, $10 for military, college students, and seniors. So again, if you're going to be in around the Toledo area, go to the Toledo Museum of Art's newest exhibit, Supernatural America, the paranormal in American art from June 12th to September 5th. Take lots of pictures. Tell me all about it. Take video, Zoom call me, whatever we can do. Sounds cool. All righty, real quick. Uh, next in paranormal news. Paranormal investigator finds strange things in Derry Township home. Ron Murphy, oh, you son of a bitch. They will not let me read the rest of it. So as you know, my new rule for paranormal news where it all of a sudden pops up and tells me, sorry, thank you for reading. You got to sign up to do it. I skip your story now. You go away. Okay. And finally in paranormal news. Ghost of the past? Local business seeks to blend the historical with the paranormal. Albright or Albright? Probably Albright. Albright Memorial Library, a planned location for paranormal investigations and history lessons. They'll come for the ghosts, but maybe they'll stay for the books. Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours, a fairly unusual business owned by a, a couple that live there, obviously, uh, partnered with the Scranton Public a Library to host a paranormal investigation next month at the Albright Memorial Library. The public will be able to buy tickets to participate in the paranormal investigations. That's neat, and that's fun. Will they find a ghost? Anything's possible. Sure, why not? Uh, they go on to say that there are some ghosts that have been sighted there. It's a very interesting place. In 2019, they did a, um, a 34 different events throughout the region in Wyoming, and, you know, they have a pretty good track record. They, uh, they said that, you know, obviously 2020 kind of went to shit because of 2020 going to shit, but they're back with their first one. Let's see. Group sizes for upcoming events are reduced. People will be spread out in their own teams, working with some equipment to find evidence of a haunting Tickets for the library excursion will be priced around $30 to $40 and uh, posted on the business's Facebook page sometime later this week. And it's the Wyoming Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours LLC. So, if you're near Wyoming and you want to do a live ghost hunt with a bunch of random people, there you go. All righty, that about does it for Paranormal News. Let's take a quick break. When we come right back... Let's talk about the Greenstone. That's right. We are back. Uh, if you want to go to, if you want some merch for Paranormal Almanac, you can head over to uh, storeenvy.com, search, search for Paranormal Almanac. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can go over to patreon.com for little as a dollar a month. You're supporting this podcast. I want to thank everybody that's done anything they can to support this show. I appreciate it. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, uh, leave a review, rate it, do all that fun stuff. It helps the show. Okay. So on this edition, I tried to, um, basically, I just tried to find something green to talk about. Because last year, 
this week, I talked about uh, just stuff for like St. Patrick's Day, Irish stuff, if you will. And I was like, well, I don't want to do the exact same thing this year. So let's just try to find something green to talk about. And well, you can't get much greener than something called the green stone. I'm uh, prefacing this up front by this is a bizarre tale. Now, a lot of it can't be proven, but some of it can. A lot of it can. You know, this story is like the Da Vinci Code and Indiana Jones and Ghost Hunters all had a baby, and that baby is this story. And it starts prior to all of them. It starts in 1979 in England at 19 Oaks Crescent Way, or thing, Oaks Crescent, in Wolverhampton, England. Sure, why not? 19 Oaks Crescent, Wolverhampton, England. Now, that's a Victorian building and the headquarters, then headquarters, of Paris Search and the office of a magazine called Strange Phenomenon. So already I like this story. In 1979, this place, this was before, like, huge paranormal stuff was really happening and these people had a headquarters, a company called Parasearch, and did a magazine called Strange Phenomenon. I'm already about these people. But, so they had the whole bottom floor of the house. And since it was the 70s, and they had a magazine, they had a ton of paranormal and psychic people going to the house for interviews and hanging out and talking paranormal, because back then... It's not like now. You couldn't just talk about the paranormal. You could. It wasn't like it was against the law or anything, but there weren't a ton of people like there are today. Sure, you could find the random weird book on about UFOs or ghosts or whatnot, and In Search Of was all the craze on TV, but it's not like it is today where pretty much any time of day, you could turn on a TV and I guarantee you, you could find a ghost show. I bet you any money. Try it. Turn on a TV right now and start going through the channels and stop when you find a ghost show. I bet you find one. But anyhow, so these people were all hanging out in this groovy house in the 1970s in England, in Victoria building, old building, talking to a bunch of psychics. So they knew just about everyone paranormal or psychic in the whole area. The reason it seems like I'm beating that to death with the dead horse is it's going to come up a lot. There's going to be a lot of psychics just randomly calling them. So... I want to put that into your brain. All righty. First person that we're going to talk about is a gentleman named Andy. Now, Andy wanted to do hypnosis. He's always wanted to try it. He read a book on it and said, sure, I could try that. So he tested it on a fellow employee named Graham Phillips. Now, Graham Phillips is the, the main cast member of this story tonight, the main character. But they're obviously all real. They're real people, but... Graham Phillips is the guy we're going to be talking a hell of a lot about. So, Andy wants to do hypnosis. Says, hey, fellow employee Graham Phillips, I want to try something. And Graham described it this way. He said, Andy did hypnosis by boredom. So, he just kept talking until he bored you to sleep. And Graham said he went to sleep. But he also said he was also drunk, too. But anyhow, so Andy wakes up Graham sometime later saying, dude, you were just talking in a whispered voice about the Maya, the, oh, oh, do, 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 do. the Maya Na Stone. Maya Na? Mia Naya Stone. He, he said, dude, you were just talking about the Mia Naya. He said, you just whispered about the Mia Naya Green Stone and the Order of the Mia Naya. Now, let's pause right here and say the only mentions anywhere of the supposed order of the Mianaya is surrounding this story, surrounding the people in this story. Absolutely nothing else can be found about this secret society, despite what Graham Phillips says. He is the only person who has found the order of the Mianaya. That's for you skeptics. So grain of, first grain of salt in this entire story. But he goes on to say that uh, Andy was like, here, let's play this tape back. And he played the tape back and Graham's whispering stuff about a Mianaya Greenstone, the order of the Mianaya. 
And then also start saying something in, I'll just say Egyptian, because I have no idea. That's what he said. It, he said he thought it was. So it's kind of weird all the, off, off the bat, it's already kind of weird. He wakes up, boom, here's the story. Let's get going. Now, this next bit is very jumbled. So just bear with me for a second. This all comes from Graham Phillips. He wrote a book about the experience. You would think it's a very linear path, A to B to C to D. It isn't. It goes all over the place. So this is the best that I can make of what Graham was talking about. So he says they start to look into the order of Mianiah, and they discover mentions of a 16th century secret society founded by Dr. John D., who is real. He's real. He's a real person. It was inspired by a supernova in 1572, and they thought that the supernova was the, the beginning of the New Age of Enlightenment or the Order of the Mianiah. Now, the supernova was in a constellation of a swan. I forget which, you know, I don't know the technical name of this constellation. It's a swan constellation. Look it up. You see a bunch of dots. They look like a swan. That's it. Don't worry. Just go with it. So they go down this kind of Da Vinci Code-like rabbit hole of this order of Mianaya, and they start to put pieces together that, again, I don't really get. So I'm just going to continue through it. It includes people like Sir Walter Raleigh, Robert Katz, Catesby, Catesby, Robert Catesby, Catesby, uh, Robert Catesby. And they say they found documents about how this order of Mianaya possessed a sacred green gemstone with supernatural powers. This ring was once owned by Mary, Queen of Scots. All right, pause time again. The only mentions of any of this anywhere is regarding this story. So huge grain of salt. They have never produced said documents about the order of Mianaya, how uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, owned the ring. None of it. It's just kind of just said. Yeah, you know. So we find these documents. It talks about this uh, sacred green gemstone with supernatural powers. It was once owned by Mary, Queen of Scots. You know, like you do. So the documents went on to talk about how the order tried to assassinate King James the I. Fun fact, his mom was Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, this, assass this assassination attempt of King James I is known as the Gunpowder gun Plot. That is real. Now, the Gunpowder Plot includes characters like Guy Fox, You know, the uh, 5th of November guy, the anonymous guy, that dude. Anyhow, I'm not going into the Gunpowder Plot. If you don't know it, read a book. So the plot fails, and the Order of Mianaya disbands. That supernatural green stone in the ring, the, it's, the green stone is taken out of the ring and is hidden by another society member named Humphrey Packington. Okay. That's all the, the weird, that's nah, not all the weird stuff, but that's the convoluted crap. Here we go. So they start researching Humphrey Packington. They figure out that he probably left clues to find the stone in his old home called Harvington Hall in Kittyminster. So, they start to make plans to go investigate Harvington Hall in Kittyminster. Just the two men, just Andy and Graham. They didn't tell anybody else about it, supposedly. They didn't tell anybody about the hypnosis, about the green stone. And then all of a sudden, they get a random call by one of the psychics in the area, which probably, which they said, you know, basically happened a lot. So Terry Shotton, who tells them, who's a psychic, tells them about how the night before he and another psychic named Penny Blackwell, well, they got together and she played for him a tape that she had taped of herself in a trance. And, you know, she, it's on the tape. She's in a trance. She's like, hey, listen to this. It's kind of weird. So she starts talking in an odd voice on the tape about Parasearch. The people in it and a new project that would have major repercussions in the future. Hold on. Let me pause right here to say that tape doesn't exist. Neither does the hypnosis uh, tape that I talked about earlier doesn't exist anymore. So sadly, this is a lot of word of mouth, but 
Now, it is it is told, Graham said that, you know, she knew about Parasurge. She knew about us because, again, they knew all the psychics in the area. But there was no way she could have known about a new project that have major repercussions in the future. So they get all excited about their upcoming journey to Harvington Hall when another psychic named Alan Beard calls to say that he had a vision of a white object floating in space coming towards them, shrinking in size until it was the size of a green stone on a ring. Now, Graham has said that there is no way that Alan could have known about the green stone ring or that his friends were about to start looking for it that week. So, interesting, very bizarre. There's going to be more psychics, don't worry. So, Andrew and Graham, they go to uh, Harvington Hall. Interestingly enough, the hall was recently renovated, just before they arrived, it was recently renovated and the owners renovating it discovered a mural in a sealed-up wall that had been sealed since the 1600s. That's true. The mural is real. So the mural, the mural, blah, the mural, which is known as uh, the Nine Worthies. So it's called the Nine Worthies. It depicts nine heroes from history and legend. Andrew and Graham start, you know, like, again, Da Vinci coding the, the mural itself, and they start investigating the painting, and they figure out, It's their first clue because they noticed in the painting, King Arthur, he's on a horse in the center of it. He's looking down and to his left. Behind him, all of his knights are gathered on a hill. So they checked the maps and they found a place called Knight's Hill. Now, right around the Knight's Hill, there is a footbridge. Just down from it, there's a footbridge. It's called Arthur's Bridge. So they think, yep, that's it. And I got to tell you, their clues are really on the nose, but sure. So they go, yep, we looked in the map or we looked in the painting, saw what we wanted to see. There's some knights on a hill. We look on the map. There's a place called Knight's Hill. We see Arthur. Boom, there's a place called Arthur's Bridge. But they said they didn't tell anyone about this. And they plan to go to the Knight's Hill footbridge And that's when they get a call from another psychic. Her name, Marion Sunderland. Now, she had a psychic impression of a still lake and a sword. Now, she told them to look for a large slab of stone with a sword lying on it and that she, quote, smelled rotting, decaying vegetation. Then, Alan Beard called back. And he tried to do another psychic impression, and he heard someone talking about a holly bush and to not look for a stone, but to look for a sword. So, Graham and Andrew freak out because, you know, it's King Arthur. He's holding the sword in the painting. They hadn't told anyone about it. Then two people call, talk about a sword, so they go to the lake in secret on October 23rd, 1979. And they look for and find a holly bush right next to the bridge. So they go on the side of the bridge to the left, the way that Arthur was looking so that the hill would be behind them. So they look to the left and they found stones stacked up against the bridge, like all along the side of the bridge. So they go, all right, the painting is called the Nine Worthies. So they went nine stones over and nine stones down from the top. So nine over, nine down, nine worthy paintings. Sure, why not? They remove that stone, and they saw a small recessed alcove behind the stone. All right, so they cleared away. Sure enough, they found a freaking short sword. Supposedly, big, big word, supposedly, the sword is from the 1600s. And it was on a stone slab. Yep, it smelled of rotting vegetation in the alcove. Now, the sword was encrusted. It was old. They said it was lacquered as well. So they got all the encrusting crap off there. They look at the sword. It's about 20 inches long. So it's not really a sword. It's got a two-inch cross guard. It's steel casted to look like a dirk with a monogram on the hilt that says Mary, well, the monogram doesn't say this, but it's Mary Queen of Scots monogram. Now, you can actually see photos of the sword. It's real. I don't know if it's 1600s, but 
but it's in the Judah House Museum, I believe it's called, in the town of Upton, Upton upon Seven, where you can go see it. Now, pause time, I will say, to me, it really looks like a modern casting of metal. You can see the seam down the side, but they said it was a casting of a sword. They didn't say it was like, you know, someone had hand forged, you know, forged in fire a sword. They said it was a casting, but it doesn't look old to me. Now, I'm not a sword expert, so what the hell do I know? But the sword is real. You can see it on display at that museum in the town of Upton upon Seven. And coincidentally, in 1552 or three, that museum that has the sword now supposedly was the home of John D. That's right, the founder of the Order of Mianaya. So, again, if that's true, that's really cool, but I can't prove any of that. So, again, I'm going on a lot of their word, but it's still, the sword is real, you can go and see it. So they find it, they clean it off, it's covered in lacquer, covered in crap, they investigate it, and they find an inscription along its blade reading, Mianaya for Mary. Like the order of Mianaya, but for Mary, like Mary, Queen of Scots. So, they keep searching for clues. There's two versions of this story. Version one, they get another call that a little girl named Gaynor Sunderland, who is daughter of Marion Sunderland, had a psychic vision of a white swan flying with a bag around its neck. So they go back to that constellation that started it all, that, you know, that Big Bang constellation that I was talking about, the swan. And um, it's the 1600s, it was a star, it was seen in the sky, it was in that constellation for the first time, a naked eye, and it's boom right there in the middle of the swan's neck. So they go, okay, the star that sparked this whole thing, the, the Age of Enlightenment star, if you will, is right in the center of the swan's neck. So they go to the map, they find that bridge they were on, Arthur's Bridge, and they go down a little bit. There's a meander in the River Avon called, yep, the Swan's Neck. Again, I, I, these clues are really specific. Nothing like they find a spot on a 16th century map called Anatis Coli, which is Latin for Swan's Neck, which leads them to the spot. And on that spot at noon, the bell from an ancient church lines up with the sun, which lights a spot on the hill that when dug up will reveal a stone hand pointing to a grave. Inside that grave is, no, none of that crap. It's literally, well, it's called Swan's Neck. Oh, hey, look, there's a place called Swan's Neck. All right, boom, done. Let's go to Swan's Neck and let's check out that spot. All right, here, that's version one. Version two, little girl gainer, same thing. She was holding the sword on the bridge. They let her hold it like a divining rod, like a divining rod. And they and she said, hey, you know what? The stone is over that hill. So they go over the hill and there's a castle. They go up in the castle tower. They see a bunch of birds. They think they're going to get pecked. So they go, screw this crap. I'm out of here. This little girl's going to get killed by birds in a castle tower. And that night, Gaynor had a dream that she was up in the tower and saw a huge swan at the top of the tower. That swan flew out of the tower, and around its neck was a pouch. Boom, swan's neck, blah, blah, blah. Fun fact, both versions are from Graham Phillips. So, Graham, pick a story and stick with it, would you, buddy? Hold on one second. Okay, so they go to the swan's neck spot on the modern map, and they see a mound right at the curve of the neck, just like the star on the constellation that they were looking for. So they dig up that mound, and they unearth a tiny brass casket from the 16th century. Inside that casket was a small green stone made of jade. It was about two inches, two inches long, rounded on one side, like, you know, from a ring. But, pause time, if you want to see the brass casket, you can't. And spoiler, the green stone that's inside the casket, you can't see that anymore either. So, yeah, anyhow. So they take the brass casket and the stone back to Parasearch headquarters, that cool old building, and uh, Alan Beard came by and saw the stone that evening and said it was exactly like he had visioned that first time when he first had the, on a vision, uh, the impression, the psychic impression of a green stone from a ring. He said, that's it. That's the one that I saw. Now, immediately after that, the building started to have bizarre occurrences. Now I'm talking paranormal type stuffs. Up first, 
They had electrical anomalies like light bulbs blowing like crazy. They said they never had experienced that ever before. Out of nowhere, light bulbs started blowing up like crazy. Then, everybody that worked at Parasearch started to get electric shocks. They started getting zapped every time from every appliance. They said something was going crazy with the electricity. So, they call an electrician in, and they said, uh, the electrician said, that something was drawing electricity off the wiring with no explanation. Then Philip says, every evening as it got dark, thick gray smoke would fill the building in every room, every closet, every closed off door, everywhere. And it would clear after a few minutes. So they freak out, rightfully so. And they start searching everywhere. There was no fire or electrical fire that was ever found. Unfortunately for a paranormal company, there are no pictures or videos of any of this. And it happened every evening. Every evening. Now, the reason I say it's a bummer that no pictures or videos, because a year later, there's videos of just about everybody involved in this story. So they had the they had the, the capacity, the ability, whatever you want to call it, to do it, to take these videos or pictures, and they just didn't. And, again, they're a paranormal company. But anyhow. So, every night, same time, smoke filled everything, nothing ever found. They call the electric company back and say, look, something's bad. Something's going to burn down. The house is going to burn down. Come back. Electric company came in, searched everywhere, and said, nope, there is no reason for any of this. So then the local news comes out to film the staff about the green stone and all the weird stuff that's happening. So the stuff started getting press at that time, and that is true. You can find the news stories about it. There is even a news story about Andrew Collins, one of the Parasearch guys who was sleeping at the office after working late. He woke up to find the sleeping bag he was in was on fire. He got out, put it out, and he was unharmed. And you can find a picture of him holding up a burnt sleeping bag. So there is a lot of truth to what they say. I don't want to make it seem like I don't believe them. It's just like I like a little bit of proof. I like some photos and videos, and they just don't have it. Plus the fact that, you know, psychics are helping them at every turn. But... So the power gets shut off. The reason the power gets shut off, their bill was like a thousand times more than what it was every month. And the electric company was like, you got to pay it. And they're like, there's no possible way that we used a thousand times more electricity than what we did the entire time we've lived here. And the electric company said, sucks to be you. So they shut off the power. Well, that led the entire Parasearch team and the magazine staff, everybody in the building to leave. They just couldn't get the power back on. So they said, screw it. We're out of here. So one of the guys, Martin Keatsman, who worked at the magazine was clearing the building. He's getting all the stuff out of the building. When he said, I was alone in front in the front room of the headquarters when something rather strange happened. My attention was drawn to the mantelpiece above the fireplace. Now there was a radio on it. And I watched as that radio lifted up in the air by itself moved over in the air a few feet, and then crashed down on a nearby record player, smashing it. Then, it wasn't just the para-search team that saw stuff. The movers that were hired to empty the building started reporting moving furniture, doors slamming shut or throwing themselves open. Items were actually thrown at the movers and the staff of para-search by nobody. Um... They said that they were convinced there was a poltergeist in the building. Now, the power was still out. The uh, para team kind of basically spooked. They left the building with a year left on the lease. And they said that they, you know, they got kind of scared. They freaked out. I'll tell you more about that in a second. But I got to say, it's, I find it really funny that there's an entire group of people that devoted their lives to the paranormal and had a paranormal magazine. They got so spooked, they just abandoned their headquarters because of ghosts. Come on, guys. You look for ghosts, sometimes you get a ghost. Now, some of the braver team members would do paranormal investigations in the house after they had left. They'd come back, and they said that we heard voices, singing, whispers, crimson balls of light and mists. They said they watched a coin on the floor that became so red hot right there in front of them that it burnt itself into the carpet, and they also saw blue gelatinous substances oozing from the walls. Yep, you guessed it. No photos or videos of any of this either. 
Now, they, they go on to say, we saw ghosts in Victorian clothing and a woman ghost in contemporary clothing. Philip, um, the, uh, what's his name? Graham Philip says that he thinks they saw a time slip or an alternate dimension because the person that was in the current clothing, he said she was, she, she was like she was just hanging out there. That's where she lived, but she didn't live there in their, in our universe. He said it was like looking through a alternate universe where this woman just happened to live there. And he also said that it was him and two other guys. They were standing there. They were watching weird stuff happen, flickering and lights and blah, blah, blah. And they got so freaked out that they ran out of the building. He said, yeah, it's dumb that we fled, but we fled. He admits it. So they're standing outside, and this cop that lived nearby that was off duty, was walking his dog, was like, hey, hey, what's going on over here? There's nobody that lives there. What do you guys want? And so they explained, oh, no, it's still, you know, we're, we're still are on the lease. We're still paying the lease. We just don't live there right now. And he said, what's going on? And Graham said, um, well, it's my wife or it's my lady when she gets drunk that she, you know, she gets a little crazy Something to that effect about like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just my wife. And he says at that moment in the big bay window that they could see from where they were standing, including the cop was standing, the curtains opened up like it was a play and an Egyptian princess with the whole Cleopatra haircut and makeup and everything, but completely naked was floating right there in front of the window. And he said the cop and all of them were like, what the hell? Even the dog was looking at him. And then she kind of faded back. The curtains closed. Everything went dark. And he said that was the last time we ever saw that cop. But he, think he, he thinks he moved away shortly after that. And then they went on to say that wasn't the weirdest stuff that happened. Plaster started to fall from the walls and ceilings. Floorboards started to rot. Pipes would rust and burst out of nowhere. They said it was like time was moving at an accelerated rate in the building, like all of a sudden. Now, I will say for you skeptics, yes, it's a Victorian building that was no longer inhabited, that was, you know, left empty, abandoned for a few months. It was also, you know, inhabited by basically a bunch of hippies. So maybe it wasn't just falling apart naturally. Maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't paranormal. It was just natural is what I'm saying. But I don't know. He said that it was out of the blue all of a sudden. Now, eventually Marion had another psychic impression and told them that the building was now right at the center of a rift to the other side because the ring was brought there. Now, even though they had since taken the, the, uh, the ring from the building, they said, she said, she was told by her psychic, you know, impressions, whatever, that because the ring was brought there, that the building was at a rift. And if something wasn't done, that rift in time would spread out from the house. That the reason the house was kind of falling apart all of a sudden, at as if you know time was speeding up, would start to spread out from the house. But she also said that she was told how to stop it. She said... If they could discharge the stone or neutralize the stone, it would stop the spread. That the stone should be taken to a venerated ground, and when they got there, uh, the venerated ground, it's uh, basically it's a white lady's priory that was nearby. So they get there. They, they take the stone. They go, okay, we'll listen to you. You know, we don't want to get scared anymore. Sure, why not? So they all go there. They take the uh, nine people. She said it had to be nine people. I'll go to the White Lady's Priory, which is a nearby ruins and a sacred place. Um, some thought that that might even be the place where the stone was cut, but there's no reasoning for that. No one ever explains why they think that that's where the stone was actually cut, but sure, why not? I'll go with that. Now, when they get there, they get there with the stone. They notice that nearby, or one of them say, well, you know, nearby is an ancient burial ground. It's 50 yards from the Priory. And Marion said that something powerful would happen if they placed the stone on the ancient burial ground at 9.30 p.m. and then retreat to the priory to wait. So they go, all right, sure. Why not? So they placed the stone on the ancient burial ground. The Paris search team and their friends, because they had to be nine of them, 
go over to the Priory. They said they were standing in the dark, waiting for something to happen. What happened? Well, let's hear it from them, recorded in 1980. Once we're within the grounds of the Priory and actually inside the walls, the kind of the most eerie screeches from the, the woodland area where the stone had been placed. These are certainly not made by anything in the natural world that I know of. Certainly no birds or animals ever made noises like those. And then after a short period of time in the sky, again in the area of the woodland where the stone had been placed, there came sort of five brilliant flashes. These came in fairly quick succession, but spread over an area, as I say, in the sort of the woodland area, and they were certainly brighter than anything that um, I have seen sort of man-made, so to speak. Really sort of brilliant. They lit up the whole of the area around about. Five spheres of brilliant white light floated silently in the air before merging as one, moving towards us and exploding with a blinding flash. This is Graham talking, by the way. When these lights exploded, and the the light this from the balls shot. of light lit up all the surrounding areas, we all started to make a dash back for the cars. I kept looking, as we ran across back to the cars, I kept looking back towards the trees to see whether I could see anything that could have possibly have been the cause, but it was nothing. It was just all blackness as if nothing had occurred. We got back into the cars. I was quite shaken. Um, I think everyone else was. And we just got away from the place as quickly as possible. So hopefully you can understand that. Basically, in case you couldn't understand what they said, they, uh, they said that the five balls of light, a few feet across, started floating up from where the ancient burial grounds were. They watched them as the lights get higher and higher and higher. They said, Graham said that... Uh, you could actually look around and see each other. They were in the, you know, pitch black. They couldn't see each other. When those balls of light came out, it wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't an orb because it was lighting up the whole area around them. They could see each other. And he said they watched as these lights get higher and higher and higher, and then they all five lights became one bright light, and then an explosion of energy. And it said it was deafening and scared the crap out of them, exploded above them, and they all just took off and ran. So they flee, they leave the stone on the ancient burial ground. Now that's not the end of the stone story, but it's it doesn't get much better. I'm warning you right now, because Graham later said that Marion went back to get the stone later, probably the next day, and she had both the stone and the brass casket. But um, he thinks both of them were sold by her daughter after Marion died. So no one knows where the green stone is or the brass casket. So it's kind of an anticlimactic ending to a very, very bizarre story. But that is the ending to this story, that the stone is now just kind of lost to the ages. The actual building, the Wolverhampton building, he said it was empty for years, but now it's luxury apartments. He said as far as he knows, there's never been any other paranormal stuff that happened at that building since the uh, stone was discharged. And whatever it was, whatever the explosion was, seems to have done the trick. Now, like I said, a lot of the story is just that. It's just a story. It's someone telling a tale. But some of it is true. Like I said, that King Arthur painting is true. The Nine Worthies, that's real. They did find it behind a wall. The electrician did go out and observe the paranormal stuff at the building. The newspaper did come out and write a story about the, you know, the paranormal stuff about the green stone. You can see the sword at the museum. So there is a lot of truth to this, but I can't prove any of it. But I got to say, it's a bizarre story. That is the definition of a bizarre story. Had they found some of the clues a little bit more less paranormal, I think, honestly, I would be more inclined to believe the story. It's just like every time, well, <clears throat> we, we knew where the starting point was, so we went and looked at the painting. And then from there, a psychic told us to go here. And then from there, a psychic told us to go here. And then from there, a psychic told us to look for this. You know, it was just a little bit too much of the, uh, the psychics helping them out. I, hey, look. I would love to have some psychics tell me exactly stuff like that, how to find treasure. Plus, they never really talk about 
did the psychics ever get anything wrong? It doesn't seem like it. Seems like the entire story, the psychics were spot on exactly what to look for. Look for a stone. Look for a sword on a stone with some vegetation. You know, it's a very, very bizarre tale. And the problem with the, all the psychic stuff is that the skeptics jump all over this story. But they don't have any proof either. They can't, it's not like the skeptics can say, hey, we had the, uh, the little sword tested and it was made in the 1970s. As far as I know, it has never been tested, which kind of bums me out because it's in a case. Um, Graham Phillips does have a lot of theories about a lot of stuff. And you can really go down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole with just him but that doesn't make him wrong. Just because he's a lot of bizarre conspiracy theories, it doesn't make him wrong. Sure, I can't prove the, the Maya, Mianaya, order of Mianaya, none of that stuff, but I can't disprove it either. So I don't know what to think of a lot of this stuff. I will say it's a very entertaining tale. I've never heard of the tale of the Greenstone prior to this. I love the crap out of it. It's very, like I said, it's very Da Vinci Code. Very interesting story. I dig the fact that they found a stone. I wish the stone was still around so it can be tested and the brass casket. I just wish that science could put some proof to these stories. I Hopefully one day someone will let them test the sword and prove or disprove, I'll take either one, any of the evidence that is around on this story. But, um, but uh, anyhow... So that is the story of the green stone. I hope you guys like this one. It's a little bit of a different one. I wanted just one good one and done story to tell you guys for St. Patrick's Day. So have a happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a shamrock shake. Have a green beer. Whatever you're going to do, make sure you wear green. If you're not wearing green, pinch yourself because it's a pandemic. Don't go out and pinch anybody else. Leave them all alone. Um, once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig. This has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Please, the... I'm sure absolutely right.